for, for those of you who don't know Tara Davis, she, she runs all of our children's ministry and just about everything else that doesn't fall on Arlene and Mike. Uh, but she basically teaches our kids every single Sunday, and it would be great to have more people volunteer uh, to once a month or once a quarter uh, teach in your stead so you can be in here and worship with you. Is that, is that fair? About once a month, once a quarter? Every week? <laughs> no. Uh, it, so here's the qualifications. If, I think we all have the ability to teach. I mean, we teach by everything that we do and say, but uh, Tara does a great job organizing materials. So if you're, if you're willing to teach and have capacity to do so, and here's the key one, and you like kids, <laughs> we, we would really invite you to, to just uh, make us aware of who you are so that uh, we can incorporate you into that. Really, it's, it's, it's an awesome ministry and a great opportunity to really uh, mold uh, pliable lives, you know. The rest of us, we're not so pliable. The older we get, the harder it is to, you know, to move us in, in any direction. But those, those kids over there, man, they're ready and willing. So please consider it before the Lord. If it's something that God puts upon your heart, let us know and, and we'll, uh, we'll put you in there. It's not, uh, uh, not an every week obligation, so it, sh- it should be pretty easy. Also, we have some new small groups that are starting up. And, and, and really, again, think of Sunday morning as, as like lab class or an incubator. We're coming in here and, and we're learning how to love one another and be loved and grow in the Lord. And small groups are, are a way to take that idea and kind of break it into real life in, in a smaller setting. So if, you, if you're kind of you know, longing for connection, you're longing for kind of sharing your lives with other people, maybe you already have that going on, that's fine. But if, if that's something that you're looking for, we've got a couple new small groups starting up right now, and we'd like to plug you into those. So if you could let Mike uh, or Arlene or myself know uh, here at the church, we'd, we'd like to hear from you. All right. You know, we have a saying, when you converse about a particular topic and, and you, you talk way too long about that particular topic, you're, you're, you're beating what? You're beating a dead horse. I don't believe that we could ever fall into that trap when talking about the love of Jesus Christ. Do you? I, I like that song that I could sing of your love forever. I mean, can, can we not sing of his love forever and talk about his love forever? And, and if there's a book that is about the love of God, it, it is the gospel of John. Are we not learning that? And isn't it interesting that, that the writer of this gospel refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved? It's not as if he was the only one of the disciples whom Jesus loved, but, but it's just an indication of the reality that John experienced the love of Jesus Christ. And he was comfortable referring him, to himself in, in that manner. I think that that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. So, so we're going to talk about the love of Jesus Christ as we continue to, uh, to study uh, the gospel of John. Uh, how, ma- how many people are able to stand watching uh, news these days? Still have some? Okay. How many people watched the uh, 68th annual National Prayer Breakfast? Anybody? Jessica, we've got a couple here. Myrna did. Anybody else? I strongly encourage you to, to check it out. Uh, Arthur C. Brooks, uh, who is an author. He's, a, he's been featured on TED Talks. Uh, he's a Harvard professor. Uh, he, he is just, he's, he's an incredibly insightful guy, and he was the, the keynote speaker at this year's uh, 68th annual prayer breakfast. And uh, his message was that we are facing, now, now imagine this, that here, and you're going to see this if you pull it up on YouTube or wherever you can find it uh, to watch it. As he's facing the crowd, Trump is on his right, not in the scene that I, that I watched, Pelosi is on the left. Now, this is just, this is February 6th, so just, just a couple days removed from the acquittal of the impeachment. I mean, it wasn't that just a horrific thing to watch, this whole process. Uh, but, but so that's kind of the setting. Arthur Brooks gets up and he talks about how the, the, the most important crisis that we're facing in our nation today is a crisis of, of contempt and polarization. If, and if that's not like a picture of contempt and polarization. Huh? Yeah, poster kids for this issue. Now, 
what, what's significant? I mean, and honestly, Arthur's written numerous books. One of his most recent books, which, which I'm reading uh, currently, uh, and, and just kind of I, I pick it up and then I put it down and I pick it up and put it down, is called Love Your Enemies. Uh, that's, the, that's the title of the book. And he's, he's, he introduced himself on, on that morning at the prayer breakfast as a follower of Jesus. And he talks about this crisis of contempt. To, contempt is that idea that, that because people think differently or live differently, uh, they are worthless human beings. We, we perceive people who, who disagree with us or who think differently than us uh, as evil. And, and that creates a lot of this, this idea of contempt and polarization. So he, he gave this great compelling message about how following Jesus and his command to love our enemies is what is going to ultimately save our nation from this idea of contempt and polarization. I think Trump was on his phone the whole time, you know? But, but he listened to it. And I, I will give Trump credit for this. And, and I'm not telling you who I, I stand behind in regards to politics, but I will give you credit for him. Trump owns who he is and is, is very forthright about what he thinks and, and sometimes a little too forthright. Uh, but he got up afterwards and he, he said, I disagree with you. He says, I disagree with you. Uh, in, in this idea that what we need in our nation uh, to bring ourselves back together uh, is to follow the command of Jesus Christ to love our enemies. I wanted, I wanted Arthur to get back up there and say, well, you don't disagree with me. You disagree with Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, but, but all that said, it, it is, it is a, a compelling watch. I encourage you to watch it. So, so uh, check that out. I, I thought it was quite uh, comical in a sad way uh, to, to see this setting, you know, what irony to see Arthur Brooks giving this compelling message on loving your enemies uh, in, the, in the middle of Pelosi and Trump. Anyway, before we get to our passage today, I want to give you a little, little bit of a, a kind of a contextual uh, basis for uh, what is so compelling. And, and, and this is one of those passages that you've probably read and it's one of those passages that you could just read right over and not catch the significance of what is taking place. John doesn't explain it. He just gives us the facts. And it's our job to take those facts and understand them and apply them to life. But when Moses met God on the mountain, remember that back in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is imploring God to allow him to see his glory. Remember? Remember? The passage goes like this. You don't need to turn there. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, that is Moses, please show me your glory. And then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious to, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is the place, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, and so shall it be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Significant, right? God says, you cannot see my full glory and live. So it always has to be veiled. Fallen humanity has difficulty looking upon the full glory of God. That's what's behind this idea. Well, interestingly enough, when we started this study of John's gospel, you know, that, that great introduction, the word was with God and, and the, we, the word became flesh in verse 14. And then he goes on to say that we beheld his glory. But not his full glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father. So the glory that Jesus had before he came to earth was veiled in his humanity, right? But it goes on to say in verse 18 that one of the reasons why Jesus came was to explain the Father. So he is going to take a human path of explaining who exactly the Father is in all of his glory and his love. Now, Jesus is, is praying to the Father in John 17. And one of his prayers is, 
restore me back to the glory that I had before the foundation of the world. He's ready to go back to the glory that he didn't hold on to tightly because he was going to demonstrate his love and, and explain the Father to us as a loving God. So that's, that's a little bit of the information that's important for this passage. When the Apostle John received the revelation of Jesus Christ, it says in, John, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, that when he saw him, he fell at his feet as a dead man. Even the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right, who knew he was loved, experienced his love, still at the presence of full glory, falls down at the feet of Jesus as a dead man. He says in his, his little epistle in 1 John, he says, yes, we beheld him with our eyes in, John, in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. And then he says again in chapter 3 that, that there will be a day when he appears and we will see him as he is. How great is that going to be, y'all? That's going to be good. All right, with that in mind, let's turn to John chapter 18. It'll all make sense. You're thinking, what, what's he talking about? Where's this going? It's going somewhere good. Chapter 18, when, when Jesus had spoken these words, actually, let, let's just travel back just a little bit, if we may. I don't think Kelly has this for us, but, but, but we get it. In, in uh, 23, he talks, he's praying to the Father that we may be perfected or completed in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them. What better explanation of the Father than that, right? That the Father sent Jesus because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, that's the whole message of Jesus Christ, isn't it? And then he goes on in verse 26 of, of 17. He ends this, this time of prayer this way. He says, I have made thy, na thy name known to them and will continue to make it known. In order that, here's the purpose. The love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them and I in them. Can you beat a dead horse when you're talking about the love of Jesus Christ? Not at all. Impossible. We could sing of his love forever. We could talk about his love forever. We could live his love forever. Now 18, he says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he sent forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, the, the, the valley of Kidron, just at the east of the Temple Mount, where there was a garden into which he himself entered and his disciples. Now Judas also who was betraying him, knew the place for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort, uh, or the representation of the Roman cohort, a Roman cohort is about 600 men. I don't think all 600 men are here, but, but the representation of that cohort is there with Judas to arrest uh, Jesus. And not only the Roman cohort, but the officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. So the police of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. His own people, right? So we got Gentiles and Jews there with Judas to arrest Jesus. It says that, that they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Can you get the scene? It's a lynch mob. I mean, they're, com they're coming for blood. They're not messing around. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. Ego eimi. And Judas also who was betraying him was standing with them. When therefore he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Whoa, do you get that? What is happening here? There have been numerous explanations of this verse. And this is one of those verses that you could just re read over real easily and not catch the full significance. Here, here are some of the explanations that you would find in commentaries about this verse. It was nighttime, and the front line misstepped and, and fell over their own feet, falling back into the back line and causing them to fall as well. Or, here's another explanation. It was so apparent that he was going down easy that they, they, they drew back and fell to the ground in total shock and surprise. A more kind of 
common one. Uh, uh, many people believe that his revelation of, of the statement, I am, is a revelation of the, 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 the declarity of his deity, that he was fully God and fully man. So when he makes that statement, uh, it is uh, received in such a way. But, but Romans had little history or knowledge of that. So for it to affect them in that way, uh, I, I would say it would be pretty suspicious to me. Some people say that they, they drew back because they were so offended by his blasphemy. Or, can you imagine this? When he says that, he kind of like peels back a little bit of his face and shows his glory. That's, that's what I'm sticking with. Something happens that John does not describe or detail to us that goes beyond just this statement because ego a me is a very common Greek phrase. Uh, that's very common as to how you would answer someone. So it's not necessarily a reference to, to the I am uh, name of God, the Yahweh name of God. But I believe what happened here was Jesus peeled back a little bit of that veil for a purpose. And we're going to get it. Because his way is not the way that we see contrasted with him. So let's read on and then we'll come back to this. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, therefore, he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazarene. And Jesus answered, says, I told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Always thinking about other people, right? That the word, of, uh, that the word might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom thou hast given me, I lost none, not, not one that, that perished. Simon Peter, therefore, see this is what's happening here. You got God's way and man's way contrasted. For a point. Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus, therefore, said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Here's what I think is happening. You got the contrast between God's way and man's way. Man's way is contempt, polarization, fighting for what you feel is right and what you believe is yours and what you think you deserve or what you're entitled to, right? And God's way is to say, let me show you how powerful I am so you understand that my choice to lay down my life is an act of supreme love. Right? Didn't Jesus say it? In John, in John chapter 15, verse 13, no greater love has anyone than this than one lay down his life for his friends. But let me show you how powerful I am. To contrast the way of Peter and the way of man, and that is to fight by the sword. To try to get what we uh, feel is coming to us by any means or measure. In fact, if you read the account in Matthew, it says this. Jesus says that uh, when, when Peter drew his sword, he said, put your sword back into your place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. What, what is he saying? That's not my way. But what's significant in Matthew's account that John doesn't give us the details and just expects us to figure it out. Matthew says this, Jesus said to him, put your sword back into, the, into its place for those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. He goes on to say, or do you not think that I could appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? The point is, is that I have all power at my fingertips. I've got the glory of God veiled in my humanity that at the mere presence of which even people who don't understand the history of it fall at his feet as a dead man. I have all that available to me, but I'm going to lay down my life for my friends. Is, is the love of God just absolutely incomprehensible? Is it not? It's overwhelming. And our way is a way of, of, of contempt and polarization and fighting, you know, putting the sword. And Jesus is saying, that's not the way. 
If that's the way you're going to live, you're going to perish by that very means. Your life will be meaningless and empty and wasted. Right? Now, I'm not saying there isn't place for defending our country and going to war and all of those things. We're talking about a different, a different thing here. We're talking about our mission, right? Jesus has just got done praying to the Father that we might understand that the mission that he came to earth to fulfill is now the mission that is put upon us to fulfill. And that is to love one another. Because love is apparently the ultimate weapon of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's calling us to. So I believe what he's, what, what's happening here is that he, he's trying to make a point to show us that, that who he really is and all that's available to him ultimately isn't the choice that he made. The choice was to, to, to love in such a way to lay his life down. He says it this way in other places in John. He says, no one has taken my life from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. The commandment I received, I received from the Father. So the love that Jesus Christ was demonstrating was also an explanation of who the, who the Father is as a God of love. And so there's a contrast of God's way and man's way. So here's what, here's what I learned. How many people would love the supreme example of how to fight the good fight of faith? Everybody need that, right? It's right there. You've got the power. You've got the ability. You've probably got the skills, the intelligence. Uh, you've you probably got the resources somewhere within your reach to pull the sword from the sheath. But Jesus is saying if, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And Jesus is going to die by his own love. No greater love does this than anyone lay down his life for his friends. How to fight the good fight? You fight it by love. Paul writes the Ephesians, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. That sounds empowering, doesn't it? I guarantee you it's the pathway of love, just like he demonstrated in this event. He goes on to say, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand face to face with the fiery schemes of the devil. He says, for our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Well, if our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, then the weapons that which we fight this battle cannot be the weapons that are common to man, right? Our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the skies. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the day that is evil. It's not against flesh and blood. Therefore, the weapons that we use have to be different. Love is the most powerful force known to mankind. Do you agree? That's why Peter could say that love covers a multitude of sins. What else can cover a multitude of sins? Nothing but love. Love, love casts out fear, John says. Love is the most powerful force known to mankind. And it, does, it, does it cause you to wonder why Jesus would call us to this mission? Because it is by our love that they will know that, they, that, that, that God the Father sent Jesus and it's love him and it's love them. Arthur Brooks in his book, Love Your Enemies, uh, the, the subtitle is How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. He talks about how contempt is, is sulfuric acid to love. What a great picture, right? Here we are, if we're trying to love one another, yet we are full of contempt. You know, you know what contempt really is? It's like sarcastic little comments, eye rolling, you know. Oh gosh, oh yeah, that's your view, uh-huh. That's just contempt. Those are wasted opportunities, right? He says it's like sulfuric acid to love. He goes on to, to, to kind of summarize, you know, what he believes we should be doing. He says, we, we need to start owning the problem and changing 
how we perceive people who disagree with us. Rather than people who are evil, we see them as people who just have arrived at different conclusions. And we can have compassion on them, listen to them. And we can still disagree with them. Uh, he's certainly not advocating not having disagreement. In fact, he says disagreement is the greatest motivation to competitive living. And we need that. We need, we need friction, right? So he says that the, the way to, to pursue this, when you want to talk about rubber meat in the road, and this is exactly what we're learning in the Gospel of John. First of all, practice warm-heartedness. Isn't it, it just sounds so simple, right? Practice warm-heartedness. No matter who you're dealing with, if we can be warm-hearted towards other people, if we can understand that no matter how they're acting, even when they're acting their worst, there's a story behind it. We were talking this morning about people who, who do atrocious things to other human beings. And my, my first thing that I think about is, man, someone really hurt them along the way. For them to, to not value human life and to hurt other people just as an indication that they're hurt. And, and when we have that sense of warm-heartedness, I think we're, we're, we're moving to love one another. The other thing he said, choose kindness. Isn't it simple? I don't care how much we disagree. I don't care how much I think your, your thoughts or your opinions or your perspectives are wrong. I can still be kind, right? That's the kind of love that he is talking about. Uh, growing up in a, in a Catholic family, who, who loved Jesus, his parents were liberals in Seattle, and he grew up conservative, which was quite a head-scratcher for his parents, as you can imagine. His dad was a professor, his mom was an artist. But he said one of the things that is important for us to think about, and he's talking about just being good citizens of, of the world, being good human beings, but boy, this really comes home when you think about the church and, and its mission. We're gathering here to, to love one another, to be loved, so that when we scatter, the mission continues to be the church, right? He says the way we ought to approach every day is like when you leave the, the church building back in his day, he says there was a sign over the door. And the sign over the door on the inside said, you are now entering mission territory. Enough said. Bottom line, the weapon of choice is love. So put the sword back in the sheath, right? It's, it, it, it's true with everything. People of alternative lifestyles, people you disagree with, po politics, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It goes across the board, right? It's in big things and it's in little things. And I was reading this story about a month ago that I'm going to share with you. Uh, and the title of the story is called A Curious Phone Call. This is just a reminder that even the little things are important when you're talking about the mission of loving one another. So it's, uh, it starts off by saying, Enter Auburn. That's the name of the lady. The year is 1992, Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm curled up in a fetal position on a filthy carpet in a very cluttered apartment. I'm in horrible withdrawal from a drug that I've been addicted to for several years now. And in my hand, I have a little piece of paper. It's dilapidated because I've been folding it and unfolding it to the point that it's almost falling apart. But you can still make out the phone number on it. I'm in a state of bald terror. If you have ever had an anxiety attack, that's what uh, this felt like. In fact, I had been having a nonstop anxiety attack for the last five years, and I'd never been in a darker and more desperate place than I was on that night. For, for a big part of the story, she goes on to say, uh, describing her, her upbringing, how she, she grew up in privilege, you know, French lessons, uh, opera lessons. She studied abroad, uh, completed her master's degree, and she went on and on and on. But in her kind of disillusioned young adult life, uh, she kind of wanted to move away from that and was always attracted to the wrong guys. And it led to her turmoil. So she talks about uh, her husband was out running the streets trying to get a hold of some of the stuff that we needed, speaking to the drug that he led her into in regards to addiction. But of course, she went willingly. 
It says in 1992, but, but instead of transformation, you, you, you have me going 90 miles an hour down I-94 with my poet, that's her husband, in a car full of alcohol and illegal drugs and the babies in a car seat. And it's probably not even a regulation car seat. The baby's covered in candy and chocolate because you have to keep the baby entertained while you're taking care of your business, getting some re- relief for yourself. Well, this particular night, it was bad because if you were to have been, if we were to have been pulled over, uh, we were both on parole, so we would have both been locked up and our child would have been taken from us. Underneath my withdrawal and terrible anxiety was a sure knowledge that I was leading the life that was going to lead me to losing the most precious thing that I had ever had in my life, which was my baby boy. I was so desperate at that moment that I became willing to punch the numbers into the phone. The phone number was something my mother had sent me. Now, mind you, I hadn't, t- I hadn't been speaking to my parents or anybody else for three, four, five years. But she managed to get this number to me by mail, and she said, look, this is a Christian counselor. And since you can't talk to anybody else, maybe sometime you could call this person. Now, I think it goes without saying that I wasn't hanging real tight with that sort of thing in those days. But I was so anxious and in such a de- desperate state, I was emaciated, covered in bruises, She talked about how her husband had beat her and kicked the kids out of the car and all these different things. So she punched in the numbers, and I heard the phone pick up. And I heard a man say hello. And I said, hi, I got this number from my mother. Uh, Do you think that you could maybe just talk to me? I heard him shuffling around in the bed, you know, and you could tell that he was pulling some sheets around himself and sitting up. And I heard a little radio in the background, and he snapped it off and became very present. And he said, yes, 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 what's going on? She said, I haven't told anybody, including myself, the truth for a long time. And I told him I wasn't feeling so good and that I was scared and that things had gotten pretty bad in my marriage. And before long, I started telling him other truths, like I might have a drug problem. And I I really, really love my husband, and I wouldn't want you to say anything bad about him. But he has hit me a few times. And there was a time when he pushed my child and me out into the cold and slammed the door behind us. And then there was a time when we were going 60 miles an hour down the highway and he tried to push us out of a moving vehicle. And I started telling these, these truths and this man didn't judge me. He sat there with me and was present and listened and had such kindness and such gentleness. Tell me more, he said. Oh, that must hurt. Oh. And do you know... I'd made that call at two in the morning and he stayed up with me the whole night just talking, just listening, just being there until the sun rose. By then I was feeling calm. The raw panic had passed. I was feeling okay. I was feeling like, hey, I can splash face on my water, uh, water on my face today and I can probably do this day. And I wouldn't have cared if the guy was like Harry Krishna or Buddhist. It didn't matter to me what his faith was. I was grateful to him. And so I said, hey, you know, I really appreciate you and what you've done for me tonight. Aren't you supposed to be telling me to read some Bible verses or something? Because that'd be cool. I'll do it, you know. It's all right. He laughed and he said, well, I'm glad this was helpful to you. I'm sorry this is so long, but I hope you're enjoying it. And we talked some more and I brought it up again. I said, no, really, you're you're very, very good at this. I mean, You've seriously done a big thing for me. How long have you been a Christian counselor? And there was a long pause, and I hear him shifting, and he says, Auburn, please don't hang up. I've been trying not to bring this up. What, I ask? You won't hang up? No. I'm so so afraid to tell you this. But the number you called, and he pauses again, you got the wrong number. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) isn't that great? She says, well, I didn't hang up on him, and we did talk a little longer. I never would get his name or call him back, but the next day I felt this kind of joy, like I was shining, like I had heard, uh, like I've heard them call it the peace that that passes understanding. I had gotten to see that there was this completely random love in the universe, that it could be unconditional, that some of it was for me. powerful, isn't it? Just the little things. And she says, and I can tell you that I got my life totally together that day. But it became possible to get some help and to get the hell out. 
And it also became possible as a teetotaling, semi-sane, single parent to raise up that precious chocolate-covered baby boy into a magnificent young scholar and athlete who graduated from Princeton University in 2013 with honors. This is what I know. In the deepest, blackest night of despair, if you can get just one pinhole of light, all of grace rushes in. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. First, for your love that we could sing of forever, talk about forever, think about forever. And so, Lord, we thank you that, that this passage that, man, there's, just, there, there's a lot left unexplained, but, but it becomes clear when we see what's happening. Uh, that your way, the path at which you're trying to, to restore all of humanity wasn't by a fight, but by laying down your life as a demonstration of the greatest love ever known to mankind. That our way to fight for what we think we're entitled to is, is not the way that ultimately we're going to win what we're, what we're put on this earth to fight for. And that is your glory. May we be empowered, not only in this moment, but in the days that follow, to be uh, practicing warm-heartedness, to, to practice kindness, uh, to, to truly uh, accept other people and listen to them and love them, even when we disagree with them. And Lord, may we, we see power even in the smallest little things as a simple phone call, a kind gesture, a kind word to heal this land and this world for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.